Hello. So today we're going to consider the influence of history on stories. We're going to use our knowledge of Beowulf. We're going to investigate a real life king's burial. And we're going to decide which parts of Beowulf could be based on facts. So, when we're looking at a place called Sutton Hoo, what was Sutton Hoo? And how did it link to Beowulf? I wonder if anybody of you, any of you have heard of Sutton Hoo. There's actually a film coming out about it next week on Netflix, which is quite coincidental for us. No, this week, actually, by the time you watch this. Um, so, yeah, it is in the news at the moment. So let's have a look at this timeline. You can see that the earliest surviving copy of Beowulf was written here. So it's about around AD 1000. The Anglo-Saxons settled in Britain here in the late 400s or the mid 400s. The Sutton Who ship burial, which is what we're looking at, is about here somewhere in the middle. So it could be connected to Beowulf in that it happened before Beowulf was written down, but we'll see if there are any connections. So, like us, as we know, the Anglo-Saxons wrote poems and stories for entertainment. And we can sometimes use these stories to give us an idea about what life might have been like for people who were living around this time. Why might we have to be careful when we're using these kinds of stories? Hmm, let's have a think. Come back to that in a moment. So let's find out a bit more about Beowulf, although actually we know quite a lot already. Beowulf is one of the earliest examples of a poem which was, as we know, originally written in Old English. Set in Scandinavia in the 6th century and tells the story of Beowulf, a great warrior. In the poem, we know all this, an elderly king has been terrorised by a giant monster called Grendel. In a heroic fight, Beowulf rips off Grendel's arm with his bare hands. Beowulf later battles a dragon, which he manages to kill, but he is wounded in the fight and dies. The poem closes with Beowulf's funeral, where his body is burnt. His ashes are then buried with all his fine treasures. And this is kind of the important part. So, if we just have a look, thinking about these kinds of stories, which of these things do you think we would could be from history? Which of these things are more fantasy? Which of these things probably couldn't have happened? So let's have a think a moment, and then we'll put them into the table. You can pause while you think, otherwise I'll just have to sit here. Right, hopefully you've thought. So let's have a look. The first thing we've got there is a giant monster. I think that belongs in fantasy. Uh, what have we got next? A rich king. I think he could go in history. Could have a rich king. A brave young warrior. Well, I'm pretty sure they existed. Brave young warrior can go in history. A beautiful and wise queen. Again, could be historical. A dragon. Hmm, not sure about a dragon. So I'm going to put a dragon in fantasy. And a magical ring. Of course, we always have to be careful with magic. Um, probably doesn't exist. So let's put magical ring in fantasy as well. But you can see that a lot of the ideas that we get in stories could be things that happened in real life. We just have to be careful about the ones that couldn't. So here is a scene from Beowulf. Does it remind you of any other stories and legends? I know we've talked in class about some of the similarities between Beowulf and some of the ideas in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And there's various other places where you hear similar stories um, where the ideas have been taken from Beowulf and stories like that. The poem talks a lot about kings and their wealth, about how rich everybody was. In the original poem, I think it goes on even more and more than the version that we read. But can we trust it to tell what life was really like for a king around this time? Let's have a look at the archaeological evidence and find out. So this is where Sutton Hoo comes in. Sutton Hoo is an Anglo-Saxon burial site. It was first dug up 
in the first half of the 20th century, um, in 1939, I believe, and provides evidence for what life for the rich might have been in Anglo-Saxon times. So if rich people or a rich person was buried there, what sort of things would you expect to find? I can think of things. I think there'll be gold and jewels and weapons and all kinds of things like that. The greatest find at Sutton Hoo was actually a ship in which a man, most likely a king, was buried. The ship was filled with fine weapons and treasures and this helmet was found in the ship at Sutton Hoo. The helmet is one of the most famous archaeological artefacts that have ever been found in Britain, maybe even in the world. Um, I've seen it in the British Museum. It is pretty impressive. So why was this man buried with treasures and weapons? And they dragged this boat. It wasn't that near. I mean, it's fairly near the sea, but this boat was brought a long way from the sea. So why do we think he was buried with treasures and weapons? We're going to watch a video now about Sutton Hoo, and then we'll carry on afterwards. <laughs> We're on the second floor of the British Museum in London, and in the centre of one of the English history galleries is an enormous glass case filled with the artefacts from Sutton Hoo. And one of the areas of focus holds just a few objects that you can barely see until you get up close. These beautifully crafted gold, garnet, and glass objects were found in a burial that dates probably from the early 7th century. This is the period we call Anglo-Saxon. And this was the burial site of a very important person. England at this time was divided into a series of kingdoms, and the incredible wealth displayed in this burial seem to indicate that this was a royal burial. Today we think it may have been King Redwald. The most famous pieces are a purse lid and two gorgeous shoulder clasps. They're usually joined by a spectacular belt buckle, but that's been borrowed for an exhibition at the British Library, which we get to go see tomorrow. Let's look closely at the purse lid first. We should mention that this is a reconstruction. The gold, the garnets, the glass is all original, but the white background would have originally been bone or perhaps walrus ivory. So what we're seeing is the most intricate, most detailed knotting of forms, where line intertwines, where animals and beauty humans and abstract line create these spectacular patterns, but they're so minute that I can barely see them with my eyes. What we're looking at is something that art historians often call an interlacing animal style, which is typical of Anglo-Saxon England. The designs along the top are abstract interlacing, but along the bottom we see figures and animals. On the corners, symmetrical designs, a human figure with animals that are sometimes described as wolves on either side of the figure. And in the center, a bird of prey often described as an eagle, which seems to be attacking a smaller bird, perhaps a duck. The craftsmanship is stunning. Not only do you see inlaid garnet, but you also see a glass technique called millefiori, an Italian word which means a thousand flowers. You take canes of glass and bundle them together, warm them so they fuse, and you can slice them into these thin, beautiful patterned fields. We also have the technique of cloisonne, gold strands that can close glass or garnets. And you see this exquisite use of garnet and millefiori in other objects that were found at Sutton Hoo as well, including an unparalleled set of what we think were shoulder clasps. We think these held armor in place. The large rectangular field is filled with stepped rhomboids, these squared shapes that, if you look very closely, have stepped edges. What the jeweler has done is to take gold leaf, gold foil, and to stamp it with a pattern and to place that behind the garnet so that while the garnet is not faceted, it still reflects light in the most extraordinary way. And we see very fine working of gold called granulation. Here the jeweler has used a complex technique to fuse tiny granules of gold in very precise ways to the surface of the clasp itself. We see interlaced serpents. We can just make out their eyes and their their heads and their tails. The eyes are easy to recognize because those are little bits of inset blue glass. 
This interlacing is very familiar to people who have looked at slightly later medieval manuscripts. So all of this was found at a place called Sutton Hoo in the ancient kingdom of East Anglia. What the archaeologists found were the imprint of a large ship, a ship that had actually been used and had been hauled up from an estuary close by for this important ceremonial burial. No trace of the body and almost no trace of the ship remains, we think because of the acidic soil, but the gold survived. The word Anglo-Saxon refers to this period between Roman rule and then the Norman invasion in 1066. And the word Anglo-Saxon comes from the Angles and the Saxons, people who migrated to the island of Great Britain in the 6th century. From what we would now consider northern Germany and perhaps southern Denmark. And some of the grave goods that were discovered at Sutton Hoo may indicate the earliest Christianity here in England. For example, some of the bowls that were found have crosses engraved into them. And two spoons are inscribed with the names Paul and Saul, that is, Paul from the New Testament. And the finds are extraordinary in their own right, but they also tell us a lot about this culture. They remind us that Britain was not an isolated island and that there was extensive trade. We have garnets from Sri Lanka. There's even an enormous silver platter that was made a hundred years earlier in the Byzantine Empire. We've even found bitumen in the tomb, which has recently been shown to come from Syria. So we're talking about a world where the Middle East, the Mediterranean, and as far north as Britain were all interconnected. This is among the most sophisticated jewelry that was produced in the early medieval period anywhere in Europe. So this is interesting. Before the ship, the burial ship at Sutton Hoo was found, historians thought the lifestyle of the powerful kings described in Beowulf was likely to be fantasy as just like the monsters and dragons they didn't think anybody back then could have so much gold and be so rich however the scene found at Sutton Hoo is very similar to a scene in the opening of the poem Beowulf where the funeral of a king is described in this scene the dead king is put in a ship full of treasures and weapons just like the one found at Sutton Hoo Beowulf's ashes are also buried with fine treasures um, the funeral at the beginning wasn't in the version of Beowulf that we read, uh, but it is in the original version. So these people were buried with all this stuff. Going back to the question a moment as to why, perhaps it was because the people believed that in the afterlife, just like with the Egyptians, these people would need their ship and their weapons and their treasures to live their life after they died. We can't know for sure. So does this evidence show the story of Beowulf is true? Why or why not? Hmm. Well, it can't prove that it's true, but it does prove that people like Beowulf were around in those times. Whether he battled monsters is another story. As it says here, we don't believe it actually happened, but it can tell us about the lives of these kings and warriors. People thought all of it, or historians thought all of it was made up, but Sutton Hoo shows us that some of it might be true. What I want you to do is research online and use some of the things that you already know to produce a fact file about Sutton Hoo. And what I mean by a fact file is, imagine you opened the pages of an information book for children and there's the main text and there's lots of little boxes and pictures and captions and like fast facts boxes and things like that. I started one. This is just the first page of my Sutton Hoo ship burial um, fact file. So I've got on here the where, what, who, when, why of Sutton Hoo. I've got a title. I've got a box saying what sort of treasures were found. A little box saying why it's unusual, a picture of the helmet, um, uh, a picture of the tomb of a great king, and this is my picture of what perhaps Beowulf's tomb was like. I'm sure you can find lots more about Sutton Hoo to put into your fact files, and I'd really love to see them. Um, it would be great if you could send me some pictures of what you do. Well, enjoy that. 
I certainly enjoyed making my fact file, and I'll see you soon.